going to take a minute to review what we've done so far with the temperature conversion and then we're going to talk um, we're going to expand it to do some more stuff with forms and do some more stuff with functions so let me expand it and bring it up Notice how the workhorse 
of this function is the get element by ID. Because that allows us to point to the specific thing on the page that we're interested in. Here we're looking to see if the value of that text box after we trim out the spaces equals nothing, or if the value of the text box is not a number. So we use get element by ID to point to that specific thing, and then we look at the specific attribute that we're interested in. Remember, all these things on the page is called the document object model. What do we mean by an object? An object has a bunch of properties associated with it. So a text box has a size, how big it is. A text box has a, a background color. A text box has a font. A text box has all those different attributes. Which one are we interested in? We're interested in the value of the text box. In other words, what the contents of it is. So that's why we point to it and then say dot value. And if one of those errors does exist, we point to our result paragraph and set the inner HTML to an error message. Now, this is an important concept. I can put HTML code in there, and when I put that HTML code, it actually appears on the page. So I said strong, so it strongly emphasized it. In other words, it made it bold. So I could put a link, I could put an image in there, I could put anything in there simply by having within the quotes the HTML code that I want. I can also set the class. So I have two different classes. I have a class if they've entered in a valid number, and I have a class if they get an error message. Um, that way I can make the errors stand out. All right. I then check the value of the dropdown. How do I do that? The same way I've been doing all the other things. I point to that dropdown and I ask for the value. And if the value is F to C, I do this conversion. If the value is C to F, I do this other conversion. The value, of course, is the value of the option. All right, remember, this is what the user sees. This is what the script is going to see. Any questions about this? Now, an important thing in coding is um, an important thing in coding is um, is what is um, having code that you can reuse. All right, having code that you can reuse. Because the whole idea is you don't want to reinvent the wheel. All right? And we can take code in JavaScript and we can put it in its own file, just like we do with our CSS code. Right? And so we don't have to repeat code in CSS. You know, we can take our CSS, put it in a file, and then use that file um, on as many pages as we want. Well, we can do that with our JavaScript functionality. It's a little bit different with JavaScript, though, because you'll sort of notice that there's going to be two kinds of JavaScript functions that you're going to write. There's going to be the functions that really are very closely tied to the page itself. And then there's going to be functions that you're going to write that are more generic, that you might be able to use in other places. So this function right here, convert temperature, for it to work, it requires that we have a text box called txt temp, a area called result, a drop down called ddconv, and so on and so forth. In other words, this function is pretty specific to this page. This function is only going to work on this page, all right? Because for it to work, you need all those things. You need the text box. You need the result area, you need to drop down. And there's a good chance that you're never going to make a page exactly like that again, right? So therefore, this function is pretty 
how do I want to say it, pretty specific to this page. So there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to reuse any of this function. Or let me rephrase that. There's a good chance I'm not going to be able to reuse the entire function. I may be able to reuse part of the function now. All right. For example, there may be somewhere else on the site that I want to convert from centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right. Let's say I want to have a chart where the user enters the first value and the second value, and we create a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion chart that shows that 0 degrees centigrade is 32 Fahrenheit, 1 degree centigrade is whatever 1 degree Fahrenheit is, and so on down the line. All right. We might want to reuse this portion and this portion because we might have the need to do that portion on another page. The whole function we're probably never going to repeat exactly as it is, but portions of this function we are going to reuse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a separate function for these two lines of code. And it seems a little bit like overkill, all right? But it really isn't, because you want to ideally define functions in just one place. You want to define certain calculations uh, in one place. If I was going to create that chart where the user could enter in a starting and an ending temperature, all right, I wouldn't want to have to redo the Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation, because what if I did it wrong? What if I did it inconsistently? inconsistently? then one of my pages would show one value, another page would show a different value. So I'm going to put this in its own function. Now, this function is going to require an argument. In other words, I can't simply say, what's the answer if you convert Fahrenheit to centigrade? Well, convert what temperature from Fahrenheit to centigrade? You have to give an additional piece of information. So I simply can't say convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. I have to say convert what temperature in Fahrenheit to centigrade. This function will also have a return value. So that's another thing that functions can have. The return value is sort of the answer to the function. In other words, it's the final answer. I've done the calculations. Here's the answer. So I'm going to write a function here. I'm going to call it convert C to F. And I'm going to give it an argument. What's an argument? That's the additional piece of information that the function needs to do its job. So in this case, if I want to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit, I have to tell it what temperature in centigrade do I want to convert. All right, so how do I convert centigrade to Fahrenheit? I multiply by nine fifths, right? And then I add 32. Now the other thing that we have in this function that's new is we have a return value. The return value represents the function's answer. Now, a function can take multiple arguments. If we were calculating, for example, someone's GPA. To calculate the GPA, you need to know their total number of points, all right? And you need to know the number of credit hours or something like that. I don't know. You need to know a couple of things, all right? In the case of converting centigrade to Fahrenheit, I only need one thing. I just need to know what temperature in centigrade. So that's going to be the argument. 
So whatever argument this gives, this function is given when it runs, I'm going to take that argument, multiply it by 9 fifths, and then add 32 to it. And then that's my answer. The return value constitutes the final answer. This is my answer. Give it back to whoever asked it. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to replace this by calling my function. And I'm going to say Fahrenheit equals convert, whoops, convert C to F centigrade. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take the value that I pulled from the text box. I'm going to make that the argument to this function. I'm going to call that function. I'm going to use that argument to do the calculation. And then I'm going to return the result. And that result I put in my variable. And then I output it to the, to the page. I'm going to do the same thing with convert I'm going to take the argument that gets passed. I'm going to subtract 32 from it, multiply it by 5 ninths, and then I'm going to return that as the answer. So I can change this line of code to say centigrade equals and give it the value of the Fahrenheit variable. That is the variable that I've pulled, the value that I've pulled from the text box. Now this might not look like a big deal. Alright? All I've done is I've moved a little bit of code around. And if anything, it, it might look like I've just made things more complicated. The benefit of this is I can, once I've assured myself that this works, I can go put this in a library of functions. Alright? And then anyone that wants to do a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion on my site can just call my JavaScript function. All right? And they don't have to remember the rules for doing the calculation. Now, Fahrenheit to centigrade is an easy calculation. But imagine a more complex calculation. Like, uh, imagine like to the, the cost to mail something. Right? The cost to mail something depends on a lot of things. It depends on the size of the package that you're mailing. It depends on where it's going. It depends on how quickly you want it to be there. So there's three factors. And there's a, the whole involved set of if statements that if it weighs more than this and you want it overnight and you're sending it here, this is how much it's going to cost and so on and so forth. So if you get that calculation right, you don't want everyone to duplicate that calculation. Because if it's complicated, someone's bound to get it wrong somewhere down the line. So, as programmers, we want to write code that's reusable so that people can, don't have to reinvent the wheel, but can simply use the calculation that you've provided. So, once we made sure that this is work, work, works, we're going to go and we're going to put this in its own file. And then we're going to include that file anytime we need to do calculations of Fahrenheit to centigrade. So, let's make sure that this works. So, 32 Fahrenheit to centigrade, temperature in centigrade is zero. Yay, it works. 100 centigrade to Fahrenheit, it should say 212, and that works. Now, if I was doing this, I'd do some other tests to make sure that it works, but 
I think we can be pretty confident in this case that it works. So let's review this because we've now added in another function and we've added in a function that accepts an argument and gives us a return value. So here, when we get here, we say centigrade equals convert F to C. And then we give it the argument of Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is a variable that we've pulled from our text box. So whatever the value of the text box is, we've put it in the variable Fahrenheit. When we call the function, we call it with that argument, which means that whatever value was in Fahrenheit gets stuffed into this variable arg C, or I'm sorry, arg F. And then we use that in the calculation, and whatever answer we got, we return. So a return statement returns the answer that the function has come up with to whoever called it. So in this case, what do we do with it? Well, we take whatever value this function returns and put it in this variable. And then the rest of the function can proceed. Questions on this? All right, I'm going to go and I'm going to put these in their own file. So I'm going to oops, cut. Paste it in here. I'm going to save it as the .js extension. CONV.js. So I could put all my conversion functions in there. Have a little library. So any sort of conversion I need to do, I could do. Save it. Now, just like if I have an external style sheet, I have to point to it. I have to point to my external script file. And I'm going to look that up because it's early today and I'm tired. Simple enough. Now I can say conv.js. And if I did this right, everything should work the way that it used to. And sure enough, it does. So again, that may not look like a big deal. We haven't really added any functionality to this code. All right? We've simply taken the code and moved a, a bit of it around. We've put stuff in its own functions, and we've put those functions in their own file. But we have made our code better. All right? Because remember, the way the code works is only one part of the equation of how good the code is. Good code is easy to modify. Good code is code that you can reuse. All right. Good code is code that is fault tolerant. That is, if there is an error, if the user makes a mistake, um, it doesn't break completely. It gives a nice user-friendly error messages. So by moving that code into its own file, by moving those functions into their own file, we've helped the reusability of it because we can then reuse that those functions anytime we need to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right? Then anyone that does that on our site doesn't even need to know the details of the, of the calculation. They just need to know, use this file, call this function. All right. Now, you might wonder why this function didn't get put in its own file. Well, I could, but there's
there's really not much of a chance that I'm going to reuse this, these pieces of code, right? This is very specific to this form. My conversion functions would work on any form because they're accepting an argument and they're returning the answer, all right? Whereas this stuff, well, this depends on there being a text box called txt temp and so on and so forth. So this is not very reusable. This is something that takes a little experience to sort of determine, right? What functions are reusable, what functions are not. Generally speaking, the more tied it is to the specific page, the less reusable it's going to be. Whereas functions that take arguments, do calculations, and return a value are very flexible and very reusable. All right. Sort of for two reasons, I'm going to create a second page that does conversions here. And I'm going to do that, first of all, so that we can go over some other stuff dealing with forms. And secondly, so that we can um, do some other stuff dealing with outputting HTML. And finally, so that we can demonstrate the reusability of this. So here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to sketch it out on the board. And then we'll go and do it. text box to enter in a minimum value and a maximum value. Then we have a button that says generate. <coughs> then we're going to have radio buttons that say centigrade to Fahrenheit. Or Fahrenheit to centigrade. If I pick centigrade to Fahrenheit, it will show in the column, it will show a table that starts with so many degrees centigrade, whatever the minimum is. Let's say I say 1 to 100. It's going to show me a table going from 1 to 100. And then the other column of the table will show me the Fahrenheit equivalent. If I only say 1 to 10, it'll go from 1 to 10. All right? So I'm going to generate a table. So this is similar to the other one, but it's different. I'm not converting one temperature. I'm converting multiple temperatures. It's similar, though, that I'm still doing the Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion. New things with this, I'm using a radio button. We did not use a radio button in the previous example. All right. How are we going to validate the entry? Well, a couple things. We need to make sure that the minimum has a value and the maximum has a value. We need to make sure that the minimum value is a number and that the maximum value is a number. And then we need to make sure that the maximum is bigger than the minimum. All right? So we have a little bit of validation to do on this. We also need to validate that the user has checked one of those two checkboxes. Now, we didn't do any validation with the drop-down. Why not? Because the drop-down always has something selected. If you have not defined a selected item in your drop-down, the first one is selected. But in this case, with the radio button, that's not the case. You can have a radio button group where nothing is selected um, un until the user presses something. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start it today, and we'll continue um, until we're finished with it. And we're going to try to do this in pieces. I'm not going to try to hit a home run and get it all done in one bit. I may, for example, put the validation in last. All right? 
Um, but we'll go and we'll we'll do that. All right. We're going to generate first of all, or we're going to create first of all the HTML. Then we'll do a little bit of styling just as a review, and then we'll do the JavaScript. Again, generally speaking, the best way to create a form is to make it an unordered list. So we view the HTML. Again, forms are best represented by an unordered list because that's really what a form is, an unordered list of elements. 
Notice how I have for each element a label. A label ties this text description of the field to the actual input tag. This is useful if someone's using a screen reader. And what ties them together is the ID. So the label for temp1 means the label for the thing that has an ID of temp1. So this label will be associated by a screen reader with this text box. Likewise, this label with this text box, this label for this radio button, this label for that radio button. Now notice with the radio button, each element has its own ID. All right. However, they have the same name. The name is what ties a radio button together. Right? How does a radio button work? A radio button works so that if you click one item, it unclicks the other. So it works as a group. You can't have two items clicked at the same time. So what groups together individual radio buttons into a group is the name. So radio buttons within a group will share the same name, but they'll still have their own ID. Okay, so let's look at the output from this. And that's what it looks like. All right, now we could do a little bit better with this. For one thing, we could get rid of the bullet points. The bullet points don't really look good when you're talking about a form. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go into my style sheet. And I'm going to say UL list style type none. That gets rid of the bullet points. I can then make the label tag have a certain width. to the right. A label, however, is an inline tag, so I have to specify an inline block. All right, not exactly what I intended.
don't know why that's not going out further. That's a special challenge for you in lab today. Figure out why that is. We can live with this though. Notice that these work it together as a radio button. And notice when I first go to the page, neither of them are checked. All right. So we have that going on. So now, I'm not going to worry about the validation right now. I'm going to put in an on-click event to say create chart on the button. my function called create chart. Now, what I want to do effectively is whatever value I have in the low temperature, I want to start with that. I want to increment by one each time through. So I want to go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way until I get to the very last element. All right. To do that, I need a loop statement. And we're going to use a for loop to do that. Okay. A for loop, what it does, it is allows us to start a variable at a certain value, add a certain value each time through the loop, and repeat until I've hit a certain value. So in this case, I want to start my loop, I want to start my variable at whatever the value of the low temperature is. I want to repeat that as long as the value is less than or equal to the high temperature. And then each time through the loop, I want to add one to it. So, of the low and that's going to be document get element by ID temp one value is going to be document get value by ID temp to value. Now for right now, I'm going to ignore the radio button. I'm always going to do Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. I know that's not correct, but remember, we don't have to get to our right answer in one step. All right? We can take many steps to get to there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for I equals low I is less than or equal to high I plus plus all right What 
that's going to do is that's going to start my variable i the first time I enter this loop. It's going to give it a value of low, whatever value is in the low text box. I am going to continue this loop as long as i is less than or equal to high. And each time through the loop, I'm going to add 1 to i. Now, we're just about out of time, but what I want to do is I want to finish this up by doing this. Each time through the loop, I'm going to add the contents of the variable i to my output area. So I'm going to take what's in there and add i plus a comma. So I put from 1 to 5, and I get absolutely nothing. Did I save it? Yes. Um, I think you might have a capital D's on your low and high variables. Yes, I do. Thank you. It shows i. The i shouldn't be in quotes because I want the value of the variable i. Okay, so I go from 1 to 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I go from 1 to 100. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 100. All right. So this is part of what we need to do. The other thing that we need to do is we need to then call the conversion function and get the answer and display the answer as well. And we also don't want to display the answer simply as a line of things. We want to display it as a nice table. So that's where we'll pick up next time. I'm going to post this up there now. Um, if you want to play with this to see if you can get this to work, you're welcome to give it a try. If you want to play with this to figure out what I did wrong with my CSS so that it doesn't show uh, the things on, on one line, feel free to do that as well. I'm sure I'm just overlooking something small. But we'll pick up on this on um, yeah, Monday of next week um, to finish this example up. All right. That's all I had for today. We'll see you over in lab.